Hello audience, Mr. Z here. I wrote up a script for this scenario which oriented around a slave revolt in the Confederacy, but it really hit a dead end, the communist CSA really being too early, too poor, and too unstable to rub shoulders with the Soviet Union or have any major significance. But if you'd still like to see that video become a reality and even have a better idea of how it could end, let me know in the comments below. Instead of that scenario, today we're going to explore a different set of events, orienting around this man here. Huey Long, the Kingfish, the former governor of Louisiana and member of the United States Senate from 1932 until his assassination in 1935. Long was an outspoken democratic populist in great contention with FDR and his New Deal policies. Policies long perceived as too slow and too ineffective to get the nation out of the depression, and he's absolutely right. Instead, he proposed the Share Our Wealth program, a system which would provide for every household a car, a radio, and a universal monthly allowance of $2,000. This would be provided for through redistribution of incomes capped off at 300 times the average family income in a program which sought to make every man a king. Long's policies are best described as a form of limited socialism, something which went well hand in hand with his dictatorial governing style, often circumventing legal procedures he felt obfuscated in the way of legitimate progress. Some have even gone on to lump Huey Long into the category of fascists for his disregard of democratic processes to push forward the agenda of his political majority at the expense of political minority rights, which went as far as censorship, suppression of opposition, and use of intimidation. Regardless of opinion, however, Long's time as governor was marked by tremendous prosperity in Louisiana at a time when the rest of the nation was struggling to get by. But in 1935, Long was attempting to oust a political opponent from the judicial seat of power when he was assassinated by the same man's son, Carl Weiss. Long had by this point announced his candidacy for the 1936 presidential election and could have gone on to become a major contender for Roosevelt's nomination, but those aspirations were cut short that fateful day. It's also important to mention that regardless of if Long could outcompete Roosevelt, he had formulated an ingenious plot to split the Democrat vote and draw in Republican support to form his own political coalition against the New Deal Democrats, which, even if then he couldn't beat the Democrats, would push legislations for increased state autonomy, essentially uniting the states of his coalition into an independent force free of the federal government and New Deal policies. For the sake of storytelling, we'll suggest that Long just narrowly loses the candidacy, many concluding that the nomination was rigged in favor of Roosevelt, and that the election was stolen from Long, earning him more support and further radicalizing his supporters, who would now plainly refuse to support Roosevelt because of this conspiracy. Long proceeds to execute his plan to splinter the Democrats along New Dealers and share the wealthers, successfully using his influence and charisma as a Southern politician to break the party grossly along Northern and Southern lines, painting a portrait of Roosevelt as the pampered, spoiled New York boy who never learned the value of a dollar. Just as in our timeline, anti-New Deal Democrats in New England would stand strong against Roosevelt, having in our timeline voted Republican to protest Roosevelt's candidacy. In this timeline, they would flip to support Long, earning him Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Northern New York. Long could even mock Roosevelt on the fact that his own state wouldn't vote for him. So the election rolls around. Republican candidate Alf Landon has a near non-existent presence, leading the party to slowly go the way of the Whigs, while the Share the Wealth party comes to take its place as the second largest political party in the U.S. Roosevelt still retains the high population Northern vote, and once again narrowly wins. The election is so close that a recount is demanded, and Long supporters begin to rally around a reduction of federal power, southern states signing legislation to show solidarity with one another in a refusal to accept any new federal policy, decentralizing government power and redistributing it to the state governments, essentially leaving the northern states united as a federal republic, while the south became a confederation of near-autonomous states, echoing memories of the Civil War and bringing the question of states' rights back into the frame of national thought. New England and Northern New York being cut off from the solidarity of the South, but still holding true to anti-New Deal policy, begin flirting with more aggressive regional parties, which could take a stand against Roosevelt. Long's government quickly became to be perceived as South-centric after all, and thus enters William Dudley Pelley in the American Silver Legion. The Massachusetts-born leader was a rising star in 1936, rapidly accruing members to his legion through rallies across the country. Hearing of a situation in New England, he'd return with his party and take center stage as the alternative to the New Deal policies, which he remarked as communism in disguise. His party quickly rocketing to the top, appealing to Christian, conservative, and workers' values by championing a system of corporatism. 
No, not the anarcho-capitalist kind you're thinking of, but a system in which a series of guilds based on occupations of labor, military, science, farming, education, etc. function codependently and in harmony like a body, or corpus in Latin, which is where the ideology derives its name from. Pelley's variation of corporatism stressed a high value in kinship and in providing for the group as if it were an extended family, of which all members take care of each other in different ways. Roosevelt would not be happy with his exhibition of autonomy the South and New England would demonstrate, recognizing that it was a challenge to his authority as well as to the legitimacy of his presidency, and thus he'd authorize General Douglas MacArthur to first crack down on New England and install martial law, before doing the same to the South. MacArthur was a supporter of the New Deal as well as a personal friend of Roosevelt's, and being the good soldier he was would obey these orders, launching an invasion of New England and initiating a period of intense conflict between Pelley's Legion and MacArthur's men. This action would be recognized as a violation of American freedoms and signs of a government operating against the interests of its people. Naming Roosevelt as a violent tyrant, long on behalf of the southern states, would quote the Declaration of Independence in stating whenever any form of government becomes destructive to its citizens' rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government, declaring the secession of the southern states from Roosevelt's Federal Republic, and reforming the Confederate States of America with Long as its president. New England, though already under attack, in a show of solidarity would do the same. Tensions flared and the South, no longer willing to sit idly by while New England came under attack, would demonstrate its support through the marching of Southern soldiers into Washington, D.C., forcing Roosevelt to flee and move the capital to New York City while the Battle of D.C. exploded. Combat was grossly concentrated to the East Coast, with only minor battles occurring elsewhere in the nation. Between and to the west of the Federalists and Confederacy was the Neutral Zone. States which supported neither side in the sake of preventing the spread of the conflict, agreeing to submit to the rule of whichever side won. Of course, volunteers from the neutral zone would still travel east to lend their arms to whatever cause they supported, but overall it was decided to not allow the war to spread to the west. In the neutral zone was a man by the name of Earl Browder, chairman of the Communist Party USA. Browder had been forced to move operations from New York City back to his home state of Kansas following the outbreak of the war, leaving him bitter at Roosevelt's government and opening him to become more sympathetic to the Confederacy and their socialist redistributive policies. Browder had a significant following scattered throughout the Federal Republic and considered the benefit of rallying them against Roosevelt. In 1938, Browder would bring his proposal to Long's government, pledging full party support to Long and earning Communist Party USA a special place in the Confederacy as a high-ranking party. Browder would authorize armed revolt in the Federal Republic to seize major cities, especially New York. Pelley, with southern support, is able to finally push back MacArthur's forces and begin a march down New York State toward the city leading New England and the Confederacy to converge upon the borders of New Jersey. Pelley's regime now stretched from the tip of Maine to the southern tip of Long Island. New York was occupied and many of FDR's supporters would see heavy persecution. All the while, corrupt business owners and bankers would be rounded up and have their wealth redistributed to the population. Huey Long's Confederacy would welcome new member states who wished to abandon the Federal Republic for greater local autonomy, knighting the states of New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Michigan, Kentucky, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Illinois, essentially the entire eastern portion of the Federal Republic. The old capital, now being a part of the Confederacy, would need to be relocated to Sacramento, California on the west coast, leaving the United States divided into three new countries. The Socialist Confederate States of America in the south, the Fascist American Legion in the north, and the Federal Republic of America in the west, commonly known by their shortened names of the Confederacy, the Legion, and the American Republic. In the months that followed, the three would live in brief harmony. Pelley, Long, and Hoover, who would have been re-elected to lead the American Republic, all maintain an isolationist stance and look to rebuild the American economy in their own ways. Pelley and Long would be tasked with post-Civil War reconstruction, but war, once again, loomed on the horizon. During the Second American Civil War, other nations had essentially placed bets on the winner and taken efforts to support their factions, much like what was seen in the Spanish Civil War. Germany and Italy lent aid to Pelley's forces in the north, while Britain and France supported Roosevelt's regime. The tiebreaker was the Soviet Union, whom Browder used his connections with to garner support for the Confederacy. What made this conflict so different than the Spanish Civil War was that communist and fascist forces were not combating each other, but rather uniting against the forces of the old order, something which was further reinforced by Germany and the Soviet Union's non-aggression pact, and which left nations like Britain and France fearing that this unholy alliance had them on the chopping block. 
Germany and the Soviet Union's invasion of Poland in this timeline triggers a different response from Britain and France. Rather than solely declaring war upon Germany, both Germany and the Soviet Union would find a declaration of war levied against them. Unlike in our timeline where there was a delay to action, there's a greater sense of urgency from the West leading to a preemptive joint Franco-British invasion of Germany and Anglo-Norwegian invasion of the Soviet Union. The Soviets, Germany, and Franco-Britain all have resources to draw upon from the US at reduced capacity. The Soviets and Germany have the American East, while Britain has the American West. Essentially, their trade routes are in the worst possible place, all needing to deliver supplies in literally the opposite direction they're facing, meaning enemy attacks on supply ships from America, which will ultimately lead to involvement by these states and military retaliation thus initiating another war in the Americas between Canada and the Republic on one side against the Confederacy and the Legion on the other. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your Legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.